Hi everyone, this is Trevor Jones from astrobackyard.com and in this video I want to talk about narrowband imaging. When you hear amateur astrophotography enthusiasts talk about narrowband imaging, they're usually talking about shooting using a monochrome CMOS or CCD camera through narrowband filters. If you think about regular broadband full color photography, say through a DSLR camera or dedicated astronomy camera, a one shot color, it has an RGB filter built in. So you're collecting those color images in one shot in broadband, a broad spectrum of the visible light spectrum. Narrow band imaging, on the other hand, is isolating very specific band passes of the spectrum at a time. So if you're using a monochrome camera and you're shooting through a narrow band filter, for example, a six nanometer H alpha filter, you're just collecting that very narrow band pass in the spectrum at once. You're isolating those details from everything else. In this video, I wanna talk about best practices for narrow band imaging, what you can expect, processing images to build a Hubble palette color image, and basically everything you need to know about narrowband imaging if you're a beginner. First of all, I'd like to say that I love broadband true color imaging as well. A lot of the images you're used to seeing of the popular targets, you're seeing a lot of them in broadband true color, those natural colors as they're picked up by a color camera in the night sky. So these are more real photos. The power of narrowband, on the other hand, though, is you're able to not only isolate specific elements of the object of a nebula, but you can enhance them and make more dynamic photos. There's plenty of other benefits too, like being able to block out light pollution and to have more control over the image and processing. Basically, there's broadband true color images and narrowband false color or color mapped images. Both are great and it's just getting your head wrapped around the ladder that took me a while. Just so you can see an example of each, here's a true color broadband image of the Cocoon Nebula captured from my backyard with a color camera. Now compare that to this false color mapped image of the Tadpoles Nebula captured with a monochrome camera and narrowband filters. Maybe you can already tell that that narrowband image with the monochrome camera just has that extra punch that you don't see in a full color image. Some people just fall in love with this type of astrophotography and never go back. So there's specific wavelengths of light that are really important in astrophotography. That is the H alpha bandpass, S2 sulfur, and O3 oxygen. Those are the big three. And those are also the most popular narrowband filters that you'll find. Right now, I'm using astronomic six nanometer narrowband filters in HA, O3, and S2. And that's a six nanometer band pass. So very specific, although there are filters that go even more specific than that down to three nanometers, and they get really expensive, as you can imagine. It's really difficult to manufacture glass that can do that. Just to give you a better idea of what the whole thing looks like, here is the complete visible spectrum and where HA, O3, and S2 falls there. As I said, there's many benefits to narrowband imaging beyond just these dynamic images. Light pollution is almost completely ignored in a lot of these narrowband filters. So for example, you could use a hydrogen alpha filter on a full moon night and capture great useful details, ignoring almost all of that moonlight. That is something you just can't do with a broadband filter. Certain filters are better at that than others. O3 is typically the worst one for letting in a bit of moonlight too in the kind of the blue spectrum. So you'll want to avoid taking O3 on a moonlit night. The other advantage is that it captures very small stars. And that's a really powerful thing when shooting astrophotos. Oftentimes certain targets can get lost and buried behind a sea of stars and they're blown out and you don't really do the object justice with so many stars in the field. A narrow band filter captures a smaller wavelength of light from those stars and oftentimes they're really small and nice. So if you've heard the term the Hubble color palette before, it's one of the most popular ways to color map an image using narrow band filters in a monochrome camera and it's definitely one of my favorites. There's also bi-color astrophotography where you just use HA and O3, but the Hubble palette uses O3, S2, and HA, and it maps those to HA to green, S2 to red, and O3 to blue. That's very important to remember that. And when you map it properly and balance those levels, you get those beautiful blue and gold 
Hubble palette images that everyone seems to love so much. There is a reasoning to mapping those colors specifically. The Hubble Space Telescope uses this color palette because it does a great job of highlighting the different gases of an object, and it just creates these dynamic images that are not only beautiful, but scientific in the way that they reveal delicate details. Before I get into the image processing section of the video, I just wanna say that obviously you can probably tell that certain targets are more suited for narrowband astrophotography than others. Galaxies, there's little reason to do most of them with narrowband filters. They typically come out better in broadband, which makes them so difficult from a light polluted sky. However, adding hydrogen alpha to certain galaxies like the Triangulum Galaxy M33 or the Andromeda Galaxy, where they have pockets of hydrogen alpha in there, and those filters can really add a, a dynamic punch to those type of galaxies. But typically it's nebulae that really benefit from narrowband filters that have varying gases that are reflecting light from stars in different wavelengths. Shooting nebulae are best for narrowband astrophotography. Let's get into Photoshop and I'm gonna show you how I build a Hubble palette astrophotography image using a monochrome camera and narrowband filters. Okay, here we go. So here is what a Hubble palette image typically looks like. This is Milot 15 in the Heart Nebula. So this was captured with a monochrome CCD camera and astronomic six nanometer narrowband filters, HA03 and S2. So first off, if you look in the channels window here, these are the individual channels that made up this image. And right off the bat, you'll probably notice that this green channel looks a lot nicer than the other channels. I really had to push the data a little too far in the other wavelengths to get that color balance I was looking for and get that those blues and golds. I could get some better data for a better image if I just collected more integration time. So I think I did something like three hours for HA and then for O3 I maybe had two hours and S2. If memory serves me correctly, I think I had like 40 minutes or something. So ideally you'd have a lot more data to play with, but you'll get the idea at least. So these are the color channels mapped the narrowband data to red, green, and blue. As I mentioned, red is the S2, green is the HA, and blue is the O3, and that's how you get this type of Hubble palette color image. But before we get to this, you need to, of course, capture the data and integrate it and calibrate it. So I use Deep Sky Stacker for that, no matter what software you use for your integration, calibration, AstroPixel processor, PixInsight, uh, there's a few that do it. I use Deep Sky Stacker just because it's, it's free and I've been using it for so long. But I thought I would point out that you may be a little surprised if you're new to this and you, you've got this monochrome camera and you're shooting through narrowband filters. Take a look at what the linear unstretched file looks like of my O3 data here. You can just see a few stars and it looks like I've basically captured nothing. You can't really see anything. And I've even used this, this slider to show more in the image. This is kind of what I was originally looking at, but that's typical because this is linear data, a CCD camera. There's a lot of details hidden in there, but you need to pull them out. So don't be alarmed if you look at your raw subs and they look like this. So just as I would with a color image, you can bring all of your .fit files, if you're using a monochrome CCD, into Deep Sky Stacker, stack them using dark frames, flats if you want, if needed. So another thing I'd like to point out here in the pre-processing stages, uh, so looking at these O3 files here in Deep Sky Stacker, five minutes, I've got my darks, and I'm gonna go through the process, check all the subs, and register, check pictures. If you go into the register settings and in, in, in the advance, the star detection threshold, you see I've got it all the way down to 2%, and if I compute the number of detected stars, it's at 42 stars, which is like just enough to stack. You might even wanna bump that down, two's as low as it goes. I didn't realize that, no 1%, who knew? But say the default 10%, which you, you know, it starts out as eight stars. You definitely want more than that to register these files properly. Bump that down to 2%, you've got 42 stars. So it looks like at five minutes through this narrowband filter, that was, you know, almost the bare minimum to shoot. A lot of people will shoot 10 minutes, 20 minutes to collect enough signal. And I think the next time I use this system, that's what I'm gonna shoot is longer, 10, 20 minutes. So of course that brings up a great point. This puts a lot of demand on your telescope mounts tracking ability. Auto guiding is likely gonna to need to be used. So to get a sharp sub for 10 minutes 
with narrowband filters, man, your, your tracking needs to be spot on. That's one of the elements of narrowband imaging that kind of separates the men from the boys. But so five minutes is enough, but man, it's cutting it close. So I will just go ahead and stack this, the stacking parameters. I've got drizzle on there, recommended settings. I'm not going to use super pixel mode. Some of the default stuff. If you haven't seen my deep sky stacker tutorial, check that out. Uh, so we'll just stack this O3 data just so you can see what the final stacked image looks like for one narrowband filter, the O3. That will of course get mapped to the blue channel as you see it here in the Hubble image, Hubble palette color image, which yeah, like I said, I stretched the living daylights out of it to get this image. Another image that I've shot, and this is the Hubble palette, but you know what, it doesn't really have that look to it because again, I got more data in certain narrow band passes than others. So it kind of has that greenish look to it just because I have such a strong HA signal. I, typically shoot more HA than every other band pass. This is done, so it's like, oh God, what is this? It's, you know, the camera's broken and I don't have an image here, but this is very typical. So let's open up that O3 integration just so you can see what it looks like. And it might be a little shocking to you at, you know, how little data there is in a single sub, but this is normal. So I'm just gonna change the mode to 16-bit. Already I could see a little bit more in there. And if you look at this histogram, all that data is sitting in the far left-hand side. It's not clipped, so it's in there. So with a little stretching or a lot of stretching, we can bring all that out. Of course, I'm running through this very quickly, but you can start to see those subtle details. And it, it looks like I've got some uh, out of focus subs in here too. It's looking a little soft, but you get the idea. It's gonna take some teasing to get this data out enough to build a color image. So you go through just the way you would with a color image, processing out the details. You know, you might want to minimize those stars. This is uh, mislabeled. This is the tadpoles nebula, but this is the O3 data. And this is what you eventually put into the color channels to build a full color image. There's the red, green, blue. What I will say about processing these images, I think you'd be surprised at how far you can stretch the individual channels and they might not look so pretty, but you can actually get away with a full color image that looks decent. As I said, mapping those colors, S2 to red, HA to green, O3 to blue, and certain channels you're really gonna have to bring up and other ones down, likely at the HA, the green way down, and then the O3 and S2 way up. I think you'll find that if you just apply those channels in as they are, uh, just you know, moderately stretched, the image is gonna have an overly green cast to them, uh, which is totally normal because that a lot of these objects, HA is such a strong signal. So here's a really cool tip that uh, my buddy Brent showed me, and it is for reducing the purple halos around stars. Now, they're not really so bad in this image. It's compressed and small, and I've already worked on them a little bit, but this is the trick. So there's a few ways to go about it. Here's one. I'm just going to copy this layer, put it on top, and through the Adobe Camera Raw filter, there's a few tools that will help with this, and this can be helpful. In the Lens Correction tab, you can use the Defringe tools to adjust. So I'm gonna just choose the purple hues here, and then increase that purple amount. So you can see in those stars, it disappearing as, as I adjust that. So they've turned kind of white, better than purple glowy you know very unnatural looking and then there's also the hsl adjustments so in the saturation tab if you adjust this purple slider all the way down you can see again those purple halos around the stars have disappeared uh, but you need to be careful because doing that globally you've lost some of those purple colors that you may want in the rest of the image so using star masks they are really helpful and then the really interesting one that uh, brent showed me is that you invert the image. So on in Photoshop with a PC, that's control I, and you get this wacky looking image. And then you can see the green uh, around the stars. That's what the purple is. So uh, not knowing that you can go into the camera raw filter again, there's many ways to do this and pull the greens out of it. Maybe a little bit of the aquas. With those greens gone, I'm going to invert it back. And what do you know, those purple star halos are gone. I thought, found that to be a really cool method to do it. So multiple ways to do it, but when you do the processing uh, and you, you build your Hubble palette image with these channels, 
that's one of the common traits of these images. It, it creates these purple stars and purple star halos. Uh, but there's many ways to get rid of it. Those two methods that I showed you are probably the best way. I hope this video was useful for you if you're looking to get into narrowband imaging. Uh, before we go, I wanted to read some comments from the last video just to see what you guys are saying. And it should be kind of fun. Let's look here. And it always kind of scares me to look at the comments because there's some, there's some not so nice ones in there sometimes. Let's look here. Your channel videos. Let's go to the last one, which was the 100K special vacation, Ashley and I. Let's see what people are saying. So happy for you and your wife. That's very nice. On this one, I asked you to tell me when you subscribed to Astro Backyard to see how long you've been a subscriber. And uh, it got 65 replies. Let's see. So 20, 30K, uh, around 5K. Wow. Mr. Java Tech, thank you. That's right near the beginning. Two years ago, around 12K, 10K, 80 to 90, 15, subbed in July 2018. Wow, so Astro Farzography, uh, Razine subbed around between one and 5,000K. That was a long time ago. Thanks, Razine. 4K, you were under 1.5K when I subbed, so I really appreciate you guys that have been along for this ride for so long with me and stuck with it all the way to 100K. It must be kind of cool for you to see this channel still going and people watching and how big it's become now. Wow, can't wait for the 1 million sub video. Looks like the oldest fans are around the 1000 mark. I remember in an early video thanking the audience for having about 70 subscribers. I never thought it would get this big and that I would end up quitting my job and doing Astro Backyard full time. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, clear skies. Rudy, come here buddy. Come here buddy. Don't walk under the tripod. Rudy, what are you doing? Rudy.